The bread of life today will come from one place in Exodus chapter 12. It would be two verses, verses 15 and verse 17. Exodus chapter 12, verses 15 and verse 17. Believing that you found it, I will read for us Exodus chapter 12, verse 15. And it reads, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. And then verse 17. You shall also observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. And this is the word of God. Uh, today, um, our church is nearing a day of victory, right, on December 17th. So to really receive this blessing of victory, which all of us want, right? whether we are in, at workplaces or family or in school, in our, our life as Christian, everybody wants a victory, right? Now, to receive this blessing of victory, I would like to say today that we must first make some adjustments in our hearts, right? To who? To the one who gives blessing, right? We need to adjust our heart. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8, Isaiah 55, verse 8, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor my ways your ways. God is declaring that there is difference between the way we think, the way we make our ways, right, versus the way he thinks or the way he makes. Let us examine this through this feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. As we understand what God's telling us, and by the help of the Holy Spirit, we are able to make adjustments in our heart to live according to God's ways and experience great victory on the day of victory and conclude this year, 2018, with success. Amen? Okay. Uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. The very first time the Feast of Unleavened Bread began was at the most important point in Israelite's history. That was during the Exodus. Okay. So if this is the Mediterranean Sea, let's take a look at uh, some of the processes here. This is a Sinai Peninsula. As we read in Exodus chapter 12, verse 15, how many days do you remember? For seven days, you must keep the feast of unleavened bread. Unleavened means this bread does not have yeast. Okay? So it's really hard bread. Uh, Israel is called this bread of suffering because there's no taste to it. You know. So for seven days. Now, the feast of unleavened bread starts on the day of the... Passover. Okay. So let's take a look at the, the historical scene. Now this is Ramses, where they departed from. Okay. And from there they went to Sukkoth. And then Etham. Up to this point, they can still cross and go into the Canaan land. But once they reach here, you see the waterways, right? So once they reach this way, they are shut in this wilderness. Yeah. But where God led them is not like this, but over here, by the Red Sea, uh, before Migdal. So they left Ramses on the first day of the 15th month. Oh, first month, 15th day, and that is on Thursday. And then they traveled full day and the day after, and they arrived in Sukkoth on the 16th, which is Friday. And then from there, they journeyed again, and then they arrived at Etham on the 18th, which is Sunday. 
And from there, they will journey all the way down to before Migdal. So that will be about two days journey and to Tuesday. Now we can calculate which day this is by uh, estimating the distance. We expect that the two million people were able to travel about 25 kilometers per day, okay? So uh, all of this is, uh, is explained in detail in the eighth book of the His Redemption. So the night they crossed the Red Sea on 21st on Wednesday. Of course, crossing the Red Sea was one of the most extraordinary historical event in Israelites' life, right? So now, we count this from the day when they left, right? Right before when they leave Egypt, they had to keep on the 15th day, which was Thursday, Passover. Passover is the very first day of the seven-day feast called Feast of Unleavened Bread. Feast of Unleavened Bread. And God says, as we read in Exodus chapter 12, verse 15, how many days were they to observe? Seven days. And God said the beginning day and the ending day, the seventh day, is very, very important. It will be a holy day to you. How amazing is this? How God leads our life every step of the way to perfectly fit his feast. In other words, mark of his time. You see, from 15th day, the 21st day when they had the final victory. Yes, they left Egypt here, right? But they were not completely victorious yet because who is following them? Pharaoh and his army is chasing after them, right? So not until they fully crossed the Red Sea and saw everybody buried underneath the sea were they victorious. And that day is exactly seventh day. And what takes place during this period? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. This feast is so important that as we read in verse 15, God says, if you do not remove leaven from your house, and if you do not eat this unleavened bread, you will be cut off from being Israelites. You are escaping from Egypt. Only hope you have is to stay with this group you left, to, with Israelites, right? So when you're cut off from Israelites, it means you are same as being dead. Actually, the word cut off is karat in Hebrew. Karat. This word karat is actually uh, derived from the, uh, it, it actually is in, it, the, uh, the word karat means cut a covenant. Okay, it has close relationship with berit, cut. You know how when they make contract or covenant, they have to cut animal sacrifices and walk between the two, right? So here at karat means to cut a covenant. So when God says, if you don't keep the feast of unleavened bread, you're cut off from the people, means you're cut off from the covenant of God. Okay. It's so important that God says this feast should be remembered throughout generations. So we know by now when God says throughout generations means not only for first and second and third generations, but continually, right? So God says in verse 17, as we read in our main text, this will become permanent ordinance, which means this Feast of Unleavened Bread, which started in 1445, six years before Jesus Christ came, must continue throughout generations as a permanent ordinance and come all the way to us right now. So are we observing the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Right, so it's very important. This is very important. So why is it so important? Let us examine. 
to be truly victorious, to cross the Red Sea and see our enemies completely buried underneath. Feasts of unleavened bread so important. So first, the importance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now the word, this Feast of Unleavened Bread, the feast is quite interesting. This word is hog. It means festival. You know, when we have festival, right? We don't sit like this, actually. Sometimes I, want, I think the Southern Baptist style is the right way to <laughs> worship because they all stand and sing and praise, right? right? It should be a festival to celebrate. And not only that, it's a recurring cycle. It means it repeats again and again and again, right? Like today is the seventh day, right? Actually, the eighth day, but it's in the seven-week cycle, right? So is this day where our Lord Jesus Christ shattered the power of sin and death and released us free, is this day a festival to us? It's something that we must really be honest to ourselves to ask, right? Is our heart adjusted to God's heart? God says, this is my hawk. This is my feast. This is our festival. I've done this for you. You see, already we have great deviance from what God thinks, what his ways are. Now, Feast of Unleavened is very important, of course, as we saw, it marks the time, okay? It marks time. As we see in the word hog, it's a recurring cycle, means it will happen again and again on this mark time in God's calendar. Now, one thing that marked God's time was this. Exactly after seven days, amazingly, God controlled the two million population to camp at a certain places in the right directions so that exactly on the 21st, on the seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they were able to victoriously cross the Red Sea. This has important ties to Jesus Christ's crucifixion. This actually marks important time in God's redemptive administration. Before Jesus was crucified, the Bible says this verse as if God has been counting the time toward his Passover. Okay, let's turn to some examples in the Bible. Uh, If you can turn to Luke chapter 22, verse 1 through 4. Luke 22, verse 1 through 4. It says, now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called Passover. Why? Because the first day of the feast of unleavened bread is Passover, right? So you can say feast of unleavened bread, which is called Passover, was approaching. And guess what happened? The chief priest and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were afraid of the people. You see, Bible is pointing out God's timing as to when Jesus will be crucified, and the Bible is making link with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is Passover. Okay, It's a very important timing. Another verse becomes clear. Jesus himself seems as if he's counting the time until the Passover. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 26, verse 1 through 2. Okay. When Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, Jesus is speaking, you know, That after how many days? Two days, the Passover is coming. And the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Right? You see, the Passover, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Jesus Christ's crucifixion is closely linked. And who knew about it? Jesus was aware about it. So he was giving himself this countdown. Okay, so this is the importance of Feast of Unleavened Bread that it marks God's time. Then what is leaven? Right, our question is okay, we know it's important, it marks the time. What we know for sure now is during these seven days, what must we do? Get rid of all the leaven in the house, right? Then we must recognize what leaven is. 
Does that mean I cannot go to the bakery and have pastries anymore? No, that does not, that's not what God means, right? What is a true leaven? Yeah, it is the Pharisees and Sadducees teaching But not just all Pharisees and Sadducees teaching, but teaching that blocks the way to Jesus. Any doctrine, any teaching that blocks the way to going to Jesus, Jesus says this is leaven. Okay. Let's see. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 12, Jesus says this. Then they understood, the disciples understood that Jesus did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees, right? So it's Pharisees and Sadducees taught the Bible to the people, right? But Jesus says, you teach the Bible, you teach of this heavenly realm, you think, because you want to obtain eternal life, but you don't come to me. The most important part of worshiping most important part of studying must be Jesus Christ, right? If you don't have your destination clear, you are bound to miss your track, right? The destination must be very clear. Why are we here today? To come to Jesus Christ. Let's turn to John chapter 5, verse 34, uh, 39 through 40. Let's read together. Ready, begin. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. So let us look around us. What is leaven? There are a flood of information, teachings around us. If that blocks the way of going to Jesus Christ, then we must know that is leaven, right? Okay. And then secondly, leaven is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy means your inside and outside are different. The most uh, uh, strong examples that um, our founding pastor, Reverend Eva Park, always said is, please don't pretend you know. Don't pretend that you believe. You're standing before the almighty God, omniscient God omnipresent God. He knows and sees right through your heart. What's the point of pretending that we know or pretending that we believe? It's better that we be fall before him and say, Lord, I don't know. Teach me. Lord, I do not have faith. Give me faith for you are the author and perfecter of our faith. That is what God wants. He doesn't want us to be perfect because we can't be. Right? Now, Jesus says, Leaven is a hypocrisy, and also it is a precept of men. What people go by, right? And what is this? This is a form of humanism. What is humanism? Who is in the center? I thought humanism was actually a very good word when I was growing up. What's a humanism? Who is in the center? Men. Human are in center. But we must be not human-centric, but God-centric. Okay, you will see this example later. But let us first check the verse where Jesus says, the leaven is hypocrisy in Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Okay, Luke chapter 12, verse 1. Jesus began saying to his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is? hypocrisy. What does Pharisees do? They do long prayers. They wear this beautiful long gown, you know, to show that they are of the, their believers. They are leaders in, you know, faith life, right? Do we not also do the same thing, right? We say, oh, I'm a believer. I can pray. I am somehow better than them because they don't believe and I believe, right? This is hypocrisy, Jesus says. Now, Matthew chapter 15, verse 7 through 9, Jesus says this. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. This people honors me with their lips, 
But what is far away from me? Their heart. What our Father wants today is not the song in itself, but the heart. Right? It's not the worship in itself, but our heart sitting here. It says, but in vain do they worship me. Why? Because what is not here? The heart is not here. And, they say, and Jesus says, teaching as doctrines, the precepts of men. Teachings of men. This is what leaven is. Okay. The greatest example of this leaven, this leaven, which is very, very contagious. You know, like small bit of leaven, leaven can make the whole bread lump swell up, right? Yeah. So Jesus says, watch out for leaven. Jesus said to none other than to his disciples, right? You are with me, but watch out the leaven. The greatest example of this contagious leaven is found in one of his disciples, none other than Judas Iscariot. Okay, Judas Iscariot. He was a, a, a fully blown example of humanism. Let's turn to the scene where, remember the scene where the, the woman brings in the, the alabaster oil, the costly perfume, and breaks it and anoints all over Jesus Christ, right? Okay, various verses in the passage, it says, the disciples were infuriated. They were angry, saying, why do you expensive this, why do you waste this expensive perfume, right? You could have saved this money and help the poor, right? Okay, but you see, it's not the disciples that they began to say that. It was Judas Iscariot who instigated them. Let's first take a look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 8 through 9. Matthew 26, verse 8 through 9. You see here, the disciples were indignant when they saw this and said, Why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for high price and the money given to the poor. Helping out the needy, helping out the poor is very important, right? But you see, who's supposed to be center? Jesus must be center. But already disciples, their hearts are left. And who is coming in to become center? The people. Okay. And let's look at uh, John chapter 12, verse 4 to 5. John observed that it was Judas Iscariot who instigated this. Okay, John chapter 12, verse 4 through 5. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples. Now remember here, God is introducing Iscariot as who's intending to betray Jesus, right? This is when the whole thing began. Said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? So that spread so quickly, so the rest of the disciples were indignant. What was Jesus' response here? The poor will always be with you, but not me. Right? Jesus is saying, think of me first. Right? Here's a big contrast. And then what did Jesus say? This woman, she's a big contrast, right? His own disciples says, oh, Jesus, Jesus, we left our, our boat, our families to follow you all these years, right? This is right before he was crucifixion. And then they said, oh, we need to buy, sell this and, and, and provide for the poor. And Jesus says, remember what this woman did. What was she doing? She was looking like a lunatic, you know? She comes in all sobbing and crying, and then she's pouring this costly oil over his head. Jesus was, you know, a young man, right? This woman comes in and, like, pours this oil all over him, and she's crying, and she takes long hair and brushes, you know, his feet. I mean, this looks like a crazy woman, right? What is Jesus saying? Remember what she did for generations to come, because this is for my Burial. Do you think it's shocking? I mean, he's not dead, right? How can somebody bury somebody who's still alive? So you might, you might find it's very offensive, right? But still, Jesus remembers this. this. She's doing this for my burial, which means this woman 
on the outside may seem like crazy. On the outside, she may seem like there's no common sense to take this costly perfume and sell it for the poor. This woman somehow knew that Jesus is going to die. Disciples did not know. Only she knew why. Because she put who first? Jesus first. Here's a very important message. How did she know that Jesus was going to die? Because Jesus said so. Okay. That's in Matthew chapter, we just read, uh, let's read Matthew chapter 26, verse 12. Jesus says, For when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial, right? Jesus himself explains, This woman knows I'm going to die, and she's giving my burial. Now, Matthew 26, verse 12, we just read, right? We also read the beginning of this chapter, Matthew 26, verse 1 and 2. Okay. This chapter begins with this. When Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man is to be handed over for crucifixion. Jesus already told everybody. The woman was there. Disciples were there. The only person who understood God's timing, God's work of redemption, was this woman because she had removed her leaven. So we must really, before the, the year is over, search through our hearts. We say we believe in Father God, the Son, Jesus Christ. Yet, our ways, our thoughts are so we-centered, right? Let's truly examine if we are really Father-centered or Jesus-centered or the Word-centered, right? That is a life that Reverend Evan Park lived to teach us, right? That's why we have studied the Word of Redemptive History. We also want to understand God's redemptive history and His timing. But if we don't remove our leavens, brothers and sisters, we may be in the scene where God's word is proclaimed. If someone goes over them, someone takes to heart and performs his burial to be remembered for the ages to come. Okay? So removing our leaven is very, very important. So the conclusion is, well, okay, so if we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when we take out our leavens, what kind of blessings is there? First of all, when we took out the leaven, what happened? We cross the Red Sea, right? Means final victory. The real victory is not here when they depart from the first day of Passover. The seventh day, you have to go all the way to the seventh day, okay? Amen, right? Yeah, you have to cross the Red Sea. Until then, the enemies are still near. So yes, the day of great deliverance from Egypt is a great blessing, but there are other blessings in the Bible. Ezekiel Temple is the final temple to be built, right? Now, Ezekiel Temple is explained in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 45, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, these chapters. But after he shows the vision of the Ezekiel temple, God says, observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay. Remember, the feast is very important because he marks the timing of God. Right. So Ezekiel temple vision, I think the 11th book is on the temple Ezekiel, right? The, the, the vision of Ezekiel and the leaven, removing leaven is very, very important. That's found in Ezekiel chapter 45, verse 21. Okay. Ezekiel chapter 45, verse 21. Do we have that verse in the PowerPoint? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I think I took that out. It says, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, you shall have the Passover, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. Okay. 
Now, there's another, there's another occasion, actually there are two times, but one time is during the days of Hezekiah. You know, he was recognized as a good king because they observed Passover in unprecedented ways. Okay. But what is the result of keeping the Passover? Let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 18. Okay. Yet they ate the Passover otherwise and prescribed, and for Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God. Right? I pray that this will be our prayer from now until the day of victory, until the day of the end of the year 2018. Amen? Everyone's heart prepared to seek who? Seek God. So the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. Amen? It's great blessings of healing is at hand. And the next verse, there's great joy. Okay? The sons of Israel present in Jerusalem, celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days with great joy. So there was a great joy in Jerusalem because there was nothing like this in Jerusalem since the days of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And I pray, Pyongyangjie Church, who have received the word of redemptive history, who have received the meaning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right, in the redemptive historical perspective, will be able to celebrate together this great joy. Amen? Okay. And then, last, the one more. Same, same day, same passage. Then, the Levitical priest arose and blessed the people, right? And guess what happened? Their voices was heard. And the prayer came all the way to where? God's holy dwelling place to heaven. Okay. Are you ready? Right? I think we can do it. As a team, as a shalo, as a Pyongyangjie church, as all the churches across the world, right? Let us remove our leaven. Let's remember God says in Isaiah 55, verse 8, My thought is not your thought. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts, my ways are much better. And I'm leading you to the victory, right? So I pray that this year we'll prepare the, the New Year's Eve, right? As we, we were going to listen to a lot of sermons about to repent and to purify ourselves and start the new year strong and bold, right? But this is secret to real victory. Amen? Okay, let us pray. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to give a missions report. Let's pray first and give missions report. Okay. Our Father, thank you for blessing us. We desperately ask you that we are so helpless and powerless. Our hearts just wander off in the direction that we don't want them to go. And we ask you, Father, to grab hold of our hearts and make our hearts adjust to your ways and your thoughts. Help us to get rid of all the leaven so when you proclaim your word that, you will be, that we will be able to understand your timing, your workings, your mysteries, and history of redemption. Father, we thank you for blessing all of us with your unfailing loving kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.